All right, now we're at the part where I'm going to do a mix breakdown, and I'm going to let you hear some of the mics and how I use them. This was a little bit complicated. It was recorded in two separate songs. If you're familiar with the original one, the first song kind of blends into the second one, so we had to get completely two different performances. And then at the very last stage, right before I did this, I had connected them together. And that is a little bit weird because... You want it to be like the original one and how it felt. So I don't know. It's really tricky. So I did my best. So here we are. The first part of the song is just synthesizer and the drums. I'll let you hear a little bit of what we have, and then I'll break down to the drums of what we use. So here we are. This is Jimmy DeAnda and myself playing the intro called Sunday Afternoon in the Park. <laughs> So anyways, that's that's crazy heavy. On the drums, it was a warm FET 47 on the kick. My friend Earl Houston brought down two, they're warm mics that are made for broadcasting. So I did put one, I snuck one around on the beater side, and I don't really know the model I'm around, but they were warm mics. And so it was uh, FET 47 on the kick. There was a warm kind of a broadcast, kind of an RE20 on the beater. Uh, the toms were 87s, which is crazy. And then I did the Bonzo setup, which is a 67 up above and a 67 on the side. And you do one kind of a side shot and one down, which is mostly known for Led Zeppelin. And that was the 67s. The hi-hat, once again, was the same broadcast model for Warm. You always see guys, even Joe, uh, part of produced like a pro. I've always seen them in the morning if that's the same one. But anyway, so I did sneak one in there, but it was a warm audio mic. The rooms out in front, crazy as it sounds, was a 47 tube and then actually one more 67 on the room. And then on the snare, crazy enough, I put a 67. So I'm going to break down. Uh, I'll hear, let you hear the drums and then I'll go through each of the mics and let you hear them. So that's the FET 47. And that's the one that looks like an RE20, which is a warm kind of broadcasting mic. And that's on the beater side. That was the 67. And I will say that is the air of it. It just was like buckling. Wherever I had it, it was obviously too close. But... It's still in there. I mean, the tube is just screaming. But add it with the drum set. So... Even though I used that 67, it was a wham-bam, thank you, ma'am, on the snare, maybe it would have been better to put a little bit farther back. I may have just had it too close, but I was just, screw it, we're going to put them all up. And so, yeah, that was the only victim of the session was uh, putting that too close. But you can't really hear it in the track. So the toms, Jimmy had one, two, three, four toms. And basically, as he went down the toms, it was 87s. And then when he got down to the uh, last one, it was more of the 67. So for right now, I'm going to play the drum set. 
and I'm only going to be using the 67s to give you an, a picture of what that sounded like, which was killer, and then I'll add in the kick drum. That's pretty insane with the two 67s and the kick drum. So as you're breaking down the kit, you're getting a vibe of already those mics are killing it. I mean, that kick sounds great. And this is the technique about using the 67. I think I went two and a half drumsticks uh, for the first 67 and then go two and a half drumsticks over to your floor tom. And you have the one at your floor tom kind of shooting across your drums towards your snare. I think the way they used to do it was a little bit higher and it would come down. I tend to like it kind of coming across lower, but you can use your own discrepancy of higher or lower. And um, on their own merit, that's made me really love these mics. So one more time, a little bit more of the 67 in the kick drum. That stereo image is crazy. And the reason that it works really well, the overhead that's above your head, I'm panning it. I do um, audience perspective. So I'm panning the overhead all the way over to my right. And then the floor tom is being panned hard all the way to the left. So even though it's overhead, and now it comes across. So now you have almost like stretching of the drum set. So as he does his tom fills, it's just huge. So then as I bring in the toms, I'm going to take out the kick drum. I only have the overheads. And now I'm going to put in the three toms. And you can hear them being added now and blended with the 67s. Toms added with the 67s. Jimmy, you killed it. So I'm going to now, I did put one of those um, warm audio broadcast mics on the hi-hat. Earl brought that. Thank you, Earl. And we'll hear just a hi-hat right now. Now I'll add the overheads. So I'm pushing the hi-hat up the center. So even though I've twisted it by making this all the way to the left, I am focusing the hi-hat in the middle, which gives it kind of an anchor. All right, so I'm going to check the rooms. Now, the rooms, like I mentioned, one was a U47, which I thought was dynamite, and the other one is a 67. So I'm going to play just the rooms. I do have them um, delayed in Pro Tools. It doesn't really tell me the milliseconds, but I just 2,083 samples. I did it to a felt a certain way. So when you hear that little bit of a, a flex in some of the audio, I just like to do that. with My room is is not a live room, so I get away with pushing the boundaries of what you can do with time delays of room mic. So here's just the rooms by themselves, which is 147 to the right and a 67 to the left.
Now I'm gonna add the kick and the snare into that. That's massive. So once again, FET 47 on the kick, U67 on the snare, 87s on the tom, 67s in the bonzo Led Zeppelin style. I got a hi-hat mic kind of anchoring it in the center. And in the rooms, I'm adding in a tube U47 or a WA47, excuse me, and also a 67, which are tube mics. And I kind of do something weird. I put them close to the floor. If you can imagine the kick drum, both of these mics are just on the outside of the kick drum. And I have them facing towards the drums. That's kind of the shot I want. I don't want the kick drum coming into them. I kind of want the bottom of the snare, a little bit of some imagery when he goes to the toms on this side. They're both set to Omni and then I've delayed them a few milliseconds. So I'm gonna play the drums without the rooms, and then I'll add the rooms in, and that's the last, at least of the first half of the song, on the style of the drums. So here's without the rooms. <laughs> now I'm gonna add the rooms. So I have all the drums being bussed into this auxiliary. On the auxiliary, because of my feelings about making these vintage series sound, even have a little bit more harmonics on them, every track that I use a warm audio, I use an API. And I put the EQ on. Here it is. I just put one little notch up on the high end. I cut one on the low. I did it on the drums, the synth, the bass. Uh, let's see, the synth, uh, that one I just kept the high end. I didn't cut the lows on the synth. On the lead vocal, what do we got? That one, I did put a low cut and I added a hair more of frequencies on the vocals. So that being said, across the board, I have an API plugin. So there's no smoke and mirrors. That's really what I used. And then one of my favorite all-time compressors, whether it was warm or whatever band I'm tracking, it's always a 2500. I had, when I was all analog for years, I had the hardware for the 2500. And even though this is Waves, I mean, I gotta say like, it just has teeth and grit and harmonics. So if you look at my drum, what I have on them, it's just, there's nothing on the drums. There is no compression on any of the tracks. There is no EQ on any of the tracks, but I am using one time delay on the rooms and then on the master bus, I've added an API for a little bit of harmonics. And my theory in all this is to get a huge sound. Because I worked in analog for years, I don't know if I was told or taught this way, but I love the sound of microphones, the way they sound on drums. I feel like when you've, let's say you have a studio and the guy is checking the snare, which I've seen a zillion guys do this. They already have their set of EQs. They're already plugging everything into all these EQs that are cutting. Their ribbon mics already have boosts on them. I, I love the idea of getting the drums and mixing them using the microphones without any EQs. And I really think that's the telltale of why these drums sound insane great. Jimmy's a great drummer, and I've done a mix, as you can tell, that is 
basically embellishing the sounds of each drum without EQs. But then as I sum them up, I can add some teeth, do a low cut. Sometimes I use a pull tack and you get this. On to the synthesizer. I tracked them with the DI and I had the synthesizers going in. You can see my plugins right here. Here is the synth with nothing on it. So you can tell where it was at. That sounds cool. And I added some compression. Pull tech. And then I put a DSer on it to kind of, you know, I love DSers because it's not like really pulling an EQ. It's kind of like a, it just grabs certain frequencies that I don't want to hear. And then also I had a little bit of time delay. So the synth layout is a little strange. I had synth going left and then I time delayed it going right to make it stereo. So here's the right going with the left. And what I'm really getting out of that is just making a stereo image out of a mono signal. And I just wanted the synths to be wide. I knew later on I was going to um, reamp it outside with a bass rig. So I just, as we're tracking it, that's how I laid it down. And so I did a lot of things on the sound, like put a vocal rider, I put another EQ. And the only reason I did that was just to kind of make it nastier, a little bit crazier. And so I have three channels. Here's all three going together with the left, all just kind of doing the same thing except making the imagery a little bit crazy. So then after I had done the synths, and I'd almost finished the track, I think it was already done, because I wanted to use everything that was warm audio, I put my, I have a little small amp called a Mini Brute, which I love, from, I think it's from the 80s, just sounds like John Paul Jones, just super heavy sound. Uh, I ran a DI through a reamper, this reamp, it's an older one, I just think these are cool. I mean, they don't make them anymore, and I know they have new ones that are really fancy. You just get a balance line, you plug it in there, you run that out to your amp, and then you have a volume knob that controls the level and um, has a ground switch in case you get some humming. So anyways, I use this for running the uh, base, the synthesizer out there because I wanted to follow through with what I said, everything being used is warm. So I ran that out, and I put the FET 47 on the bass rig. So here is the bass rig reamped. You know, I embellished it. I put on a LA-2A and then I added a R bass, which I love to add lower frequencies. So this is going to be the centerpiece that's going to add the body to the DI synths. throaty and that's the center of that sound. So 
out. So that's evil. And that enveloping sound, it's really crazy. I saw a guy when I was learning how to play the part. I, can, I heard a lot of theories about how they did it. It was gated. It was off the kick drum. I do think this is sensitive enough that if I was in a live situation and this was next to maybe something that was pushing a lot of frequencies, it could resonate with every kick drum and give you that enveloping sound. But that enveloping sound that you're hearing is me banging it. I know it sounds crazy, but I saw a guy do that. And I was like, really? And then I hit it, hit it. And then there was a sweet spot. It was right about here and then right up here by the power switch. And I knew if I hit it, so as I'm playing it, I'm striking it and it's doing its envelope. But I do think if I was by a loudspeaker, maybe that vibration could make it happen. So maybe the original one was either by Alex's kick drum, whatever the case is, these are like toys. It's got a cardboard back. They're kind of silly, but... It sounds evil and cool. And we're about to end out of this track, and it's going to go into the next track. And the only difference was the reamping of the bass amps is gone now because now I have Ryan coming in to play real bass. And I wanted his bass scent to be switched out between the synth amp and then going into his bass. Uh, there was a DI. And there's also the amp once again being used with the 47. So it's somewhat held up the same. On the bass guitar, I just had a Waves LA-2A, and then I put the R bass on the bass. When he played them live, I didn't reamp it. He was playing it. I was recording them at the same time. So these are both of them together. So this is strictly just a DI. All right, then you add a compressor, Waves, LA-2A. Oh, I'm sorry, API. Then add the LA-2A. R bass. Yes, sir, just to take a little bit of that click off. I know this isn't cool, but I gave him an audio joint, which I call, I just moved him back in time. I felt he was playing a little bit ahead. That's not his fault. It's a preference of me. I like a stone bass player that's behind the beat as opposed to being in the, ahead of the beat. So I just kind of relaxed him a little bit without, you know, gave him an audio joint. So that's the timing that you'll see here, and it's barely on, but I think it added a little bit of tension between him and the drums, so that's why you'll see that on both of the tracks, same one. So now I'm gonna add the DI with the amp. This is the amp by itself. Plugins all off. Add the API. Gonna add the compressor. R bass. R bass always just takes a little bit of that snap off and adds low end. I love that plugin. Yes, sir, because I do and I can do. Time delay. Once again, sorry, buddy. So both together. And I did automate his bass to rise through the solo with the drums. Now, I did some automation that was a little bit strange on this, and this is something that, that 
him and I talked about. This really is a synth-driven song, and even though I love what he was doing on the bass, when it was too loud in the first part of the song or the first part of the solo, I thought it was overwhelming because I do love the synth. So I purposely automated them a little bit lower, but I tried to do kind of a dance of lowering the synths and bringing up the bass. So about the middle of the solo, as the solo starts to get to its most craziest parts, the bass becomes at its loudest in the song. Kind of, if you listen to Van Halen's songs, it was always a ride up and down of the bass. And I kind of felt like in this song it worked. So from the beginning of the song, um, fading out of one into the other, you'll hear him come in and the bass is a little bit strong during the verses. And then I lowered it a little bit on some of the busy synth parts. So as you hear the bass go down, that's really because I'm just making room for the synths. He smokes on the bass. So it was shameful to have him ride like that, but we were still trying to preserve how the song was. So as you heard, I brought in the synths. The synths pretty much have the same settings through the first half to the second half of the song. So everything in from the beginning, minus the vocals. All right, he is a badass singer. I do a little trick on the vocals, so I'll explain that a little bit. But first, let's hear how, and he was singing into the 47 tube microphone. I think Ross sang into a 47, so I thought, why not? And so this is the mic by itself, completely dry. I grabbed that telephone. I thought we were alone. Telling me there's company, our husband's coming home. I've been thinking about the Saturday night with you. I've been thinking about it all week long. And now I'm gonna lose it because the son of a bitch got me singing that same old song. Got one foot out the door. Time to hit the road. So the presence is totally awesome. Now, here's the thing about a great mic it's nice to sometimes be able to make it even go to a next level. And, you know, if you spend seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve thousand dollars on some kind of vintage mic, it's a little bit, your heart sinks when you hear a raw vocal in it. And you're like, oh my God. But then as soon as you start putting the whistles and bells on it, you're like, I love this mic. This mic, definitely the same thing. So as we used it, it was very raw, but I just added a little bit of delay API, which I boost a little bit of the upper frequencies, put a cut on it. Um, I put a decapitator because as I was playing the track, I just felt I wanted a little bit grittier. I did slip him back in time a hair. And once again, this is just a preference. The reason I use the time 
settings, sometimes when a band plays the song, for whatever reason, the energy or the excitement, sometimes you're playing ahead of the beat. I, for whatever reason, very sensitive to that. I just move around and then, I'm, then I'll slide them back in time. And I think hip hop bands do that all the time, but I just, I love it because you could never get that emotion out of him when he did it. And by pushing him back in time, it just makes him feel like he's a stud. He's just like, you know what, screw you. I'm going to sing it this way. And he sang it that way, and then I moved it around. <laughs> but he did sing it that way. That's the main vocal by itself. So here's with all the whistles and bells. I grabbed that telephone. I thought we were alone. Telling me there's company. Our husband's coming home. Okay, so then if you look at the files on the waves, you're going to see three of them. A lot of guys, I think people now, modern, you could just use a plug-in and run it into some kind of delay, and you can split it and even tie harmonize or do something to it. I think because I was old school and ran, ran off consoles and tape machines, I just duplicate them, and then I slip them back in time, two of them. So I always do uh, main vocal, and then I'll duplicate it two times, I'll make one left, one right. Same plugins, except I won't use the analog, analog delay because I'm already delaying it. And this is the effect. So I'm going to bring in the right and then the left, and you'll hear it, how the imagery. So once again, the theory is I have one vocal in the center that's hardcore. I'm making one go to the right, which has a certain length of delay, not too long. And then the one that goes to the left, I'm really extending the delay. So it adds a very nice, I think, a 3D image of the vocals without putting it in, processing it through some fancy delay or some cool plugin. I think it just sounds, I don't know, it's kind of like meat and potatoes, basic. It's cool. I love it. All right, so here's the right. I grabbed that telephone. I thought we were alone. Telling me there's company. Our husband's coming home. I've been thinking about the Saturday night with you. I've been thinking about it all week long. All right, so that was with the right in. So now I'm going to add the left in. I'll play you all. I'll play all three together, and then I'll remove the right and the left, so you can hear uh, kind of how that's spreading out. And once again, this is to taste because I never want the vocals to belittle the music, especially on a track like this. It's not a pop song, so you want his vocals to almost sound like they're barely surviving. He's like, vocals are drowning. He's coming out of this like fire and this mess of this synth and it's gritty it's nasty so adding this gives him depth and dimension over crazy synths and crazy drums and for me this works and it's a cool little technique so once again i've duplicated the vocal three times i'm delaying one right and delaying one left i'm using on each one a time delay and i'm just moving it uh back and forth so there's the right and there's the left, and you can see how they're a little bit farther apart. Here's all three. I grabbed that telephone. I thought we were alone. Telling me there's company. Our husband's coming home. I've been thinking about the Saturday night with you. I've been thinking about it all week long. One foot out the door, got one foot out the door. Keep the motor running, don't you let it cool down. Foot flat to the floor, put the pedal to the metal and you beat it out of town. Coming back, back for more. Sorry, I'm into it. To me, this is like, I know people do mixing and it's like crazy and they want to do all this fancy stuff. I really just love mixing like it's an old school console. I am duplicating things. I am running. Everything is running. The only thing that I have that's running into like an aux is the drums. But I don't do that thing where people do an aux for the guitars and the bass and the vocals. There is a really great theory in that where if you have a lot of tracks, it gives you control of four or five faders that really control the mixes without going to each individual one. But since all these, since most of the bands I record, I'm producing it myself, I track them individually with different sounds, and I like to move them up. I don't really sum them up into one compressor. I like that energy of them flowing and kind of being a little bit messy. 
So now we're going to get to the guitar solo. This guitar, which I showed you earlier, and the solo is playing out of a small Alamo amp. It's a 60s amp. There's nothing vicious, low endy Marshall, Jose Arredondo, modified Marshall head. This is the legal, which I'm running it through. And the reason I use that amp is sometimes I'll doodle on Instagram and I'll do like a Randy Rhodes solo or I'll do Alex Lifeson from Rush. And I always love that little amp with the rat pedal. So when it came to this solo, and I already know that guitar, which I showed you is going to rock, I used that amp because it was already like, you know, I already know it's going to work. So it worked in the sense of getting it done. May not have worked in the sense of making me sound like Eddie. So the amp by itself had an 87 on it. So I'm going to play that. And I want you to just hear it dry. It's a little nasty. And the other mic that you see on that is that weird dynamic that I use on the hi-hat and the toms. I didn't really like it. I kept it in there, whatever. I needed something else because that was just a weird amp. So forgive. So here is both mics. And you're only hearing, this one is the first one, which is the 87 on the small Alamo, on the solo. Oh, that's kind of nasty. So I added a Kramer. Eddie Kramer has this EQ. I love to use it because it kind of clears up some of the upper frequencies. So I engage this one in the solo. A little bit better. Now I'm adding the API. I did more of a cut on this one because the amp was a little bit muddy. So that's why you see the boost and the cut. Then I added a compressor, a bluey, and nothing special, just kind of bringing it up in volume over the track. So you hear that reverb too. So on the solo, because I don't have the most flattering amp and sound, even though the guitar was super cool, I want to add a little bit of imagery. So you're going to notice when I play the middle part of the solo, I have an auxiliary send of the guitar going to the left. And you're going to see that ride up and down a little bit embellishing the guitar solo. And I just, I just kind of automated that in the middle. It's not on all the time, but definitely towards the middle section, so check it out. <laughs> then the delay that you hear kind of washing out the guitar sound. I automated that as well. It's not really in all the time, but it, it's, I wanted the ending to happen. There's a song, I think it's called Tor Tor, something off Women and Children First, where the Van Halen song ends and you hear this reverb. So I matched the reverb what I thought that would have been. And that's an EMT plate. I have an EQ on it that's boosting a little bit of the mids, totally cut all the bottom out and the top out. Little, little de-esser, it looks like I'm cutting uh, about 3,500 and I'm just dropping it all the way down to the bottom. Let's see how much it's really doing. All right. 
So obviously I'm having fun with this. So that's kind of the layout of the guitar. So I have two mics on the guitar. One I didn't really favor more than the other. The 87 is rocking on the Alamo. I've got chorus on it. The chorus is just a stock air chorus. And, you know, there is a sound that Eddie had as he started to evolve using um, Eventide harmonizers and chorusing. I personally didn't go down that rabbit hole. So I just added a chorus and put it to, I don't know, something I thought was cool. And that's how I had this fun because I definitely didn't make the benchmark of recreating it, but it had to sound tough as nails and it had to sound exciting. And this is my way of blurring those lines a little bit to get a little bit of that Eddie spirit in the playing. So that was it. So then I have the guitar going out to it. I lied about the other aux. I had two more. One was on the guitar going left and right. The other one was, I labeled it miscellaneous effects. And that was the reverb, the EMT plate. Everything is pretty much slammed into the master fader. Now there's a lot of people, I should say maybe even now, that don't use master faders anymore. They use an aux. They don't want their effects to be influenced by the level of the audio. Because I'm totally old school, I mix into these things like in the old days. If I had a, you know, I do have an SSL, I have an Allen Smart. So not to be, you know, lying to you guys, it's actually the last stage before it leaves my speakers is going into this Allen Smart C2. And I have it set... Not on Crush, but it's basically, they call it a radio compressor. So I love this. I've been using it for maybe 20, 25 years, and it's just always on. Uh, it's a very expensive unit to not be using it within the audio field, but I just love hearing it back, and it really helps me make good judgment on that. So on my mixing fader, I have it low. If you well, listen to the music... All right, I have it going into, um, Vetus is one of my favorite, not only persons, but his company is outstanding. I have the Vetus uh, MA5s over here. Everything else I have is Brent Averill, is Brent Averill BAE. These are all late 90s, early 2000s units that Vetus had probably touched with Brent Averill. He makes this digital EQ that I just cannot not use, and it's always on the master bus. It just has a wonderful way of sounding like hardware, and it just sounds beautiful. I put a Pultec on it, and I'll play it without and with. So as you can tell, I've just added a little bit of mid frequency to the frequencies to that. I've added a little bit of low end and crazy to be cutting at the same time, and I love that. That's what that's what they do, you know. When you have a pull tech, it's like black magic. That's how I'm using the pull tech. Now, what's important in this whole chain is I have a Fairchild, which I always use. Initially, I never used it. I just I didn't know what the big deal is about. But I've come to find out that I really love this on my master bus all the time because it reminds me of a tape machine and how I would use it. So I try to get it where it barely moves. Now, depending on the song, if there's a loud vocal, loud guitar solo, there's something that's really jumping out and I want to kind of like, it's almost like tape gluing it in. I use the Fairchild. So watch the meter. Definitely the track is slamming and you're going to see that move, but it sounds musical. It just goes 3D. Yeah, I can not use it, and it sounds kind of flat, and it's cool, and it's even. I don't know. I'm living dangerous. So, uh, But here's the battle. I also have a Neve compressor. I want this one to barely, barely move. But when I use them both together, one's fast and one's slow, it's a nice yin and yang to your mix. And that's how I feel like I get certain things to jump out and move around, but it all isn't clamped down because it's these are both moving at different times. 
So here is uh, both of them on. That's both of them out. All right, I love this limiter, and uh, it's Oxford limiter. I use it all the time. I don't know what to tell you except it just sounds cool. And so here's the mix without it. I put this one on as just kind of a safety. I, I'm always doing illegal stuff on my levels, and I do try to watch myself. That's the way of adding a policeman at the end of it to make sure I'm, I'm still doing wicked stuff, but it does help me. And then a little secret, it's not really a secret, but it's mastering cats use it all over the world, is I use center, and I push it up how many? 1.7 dBs, I'm raising the center. And it has a nice way of just making the track come alive. I don't use it all the time, but on this song, I felt like it sounded good. So let me play it with it and without it. So it's very Neanderthal, very basic. I'm getting movement from the audio by using different variety of plugins. I, when I'm tracking bands, I only have really the Fairchild on. Just gives me the essence of what's happening. And I don't necessarily use all these all the time, but when I do, I'm usually putting, putting them together. It's almost like a, a deck, you know, I'm trying to get a royal flush to figure that out. And hopefully, most, hopefully all the time, I get a good balance of that. But it doesn't work all the time. Fast song, slow song. This song was challenging because it starts off slow, then it gets fast. And usually fast songs are really difficult to make sound heavy. So I was really happy that I was able to accomplish that through some of this. So anyways, that's the mix breakdown of it. And I've combined both songs into one. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. So and that's it. So the mix goes into my Alan Smart. I printed it back into Pro Tools, and the file is locked in there. Warm Audio, thank you so much. Uh, produce Like a Pro, once again, appreciated being here. And tune in to Manny's Mic Locker. What's that? I don't know. Go find it. It's there. You'll see some cool stuff. All right. Talk to you later. Mm -hmm.